Well, you know that we are on Jesus the Christ, the Old Testament prophecies. We are reasoning from the scriptures as the apostles did in the days in which Jesus walked amongst them, then he was caught up unto glory, then he gave them the Holy Spirit, and he left them a blueprint, which were all of the scriptures testifying and pointing to his, his return, his life, his suffering, his ministry, the totality of his existence on the earth, while we saw him in grace and truth, the only begotten of the Father. And we've seen last week, let's review quickly, let's go to Acts 17, somebody Acts 17 too. And then let's go to Luke chapter 24 and Acts 13. And what I want to do quickly is just review the reason and why that we're doing this outside of the fact that it is good and that the word is perfect and without flaw. I want to remind you that the apostles ministered and preached and taught, so did the Lord Jesus himself, with these scriptures. Everyone say, with these scriptures. With these scriptures. Okay? These are the words that he testified of himself. And, and if Jesus is using these scriptures to testify himself, I think it's important that we follow his example. Amen? So, uh, Brent, why don't you read Acts 17.2? And then, Randy, you'll do Luke 24, 25 through 27, and I will pick up in Acts 13. And when you're, when you're Acts 17, 2 is our first scripture. Okay, so, so three Sabbath days, obviously, he's on Saturday, he's going in, he's reasoning with them from the scriptures, meaning that he's saying that Jesus is the Christ, and he's using the word of God to leverage the conversation, okay? And these scriptures that he is using are the Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in the ministry and life of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Okay? So we see that's Paul's custom. In other words, Paul made this a custom. He made it a habit. He made it something he did week after week after week after week. And let's look in Luke 24. We now see Jesus Christ appearing to two disciples, or two men who would be disciples, on the road to Emmaus. And here we are in Luke 24. We'll pick up in verse 25 and read to 27. Okay, beginning in Moses and the prophets, Jesus said, how foolish, didn't you believe? In other words, don't you guys know? Haven't you read the discourse about me? Aren't you educated on the only thing that God has given you to absolutely know that you know that you know that I am he? Haven't you read my resume, in other words? And it, and it kind of sounds like, hey, how foolish, as in you had these resources. Haven't you read them? Beloved, I don't want this indictment to be upon us. Didn't you read what was written about me? So week after week, our custom is reasoning from the scriptures. And let's go here to Acts chapter 13. I'm reading here when Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch. In Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 13, we'll just read a few verses and skip to the end. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Pamphos and came to Pergia in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But when they went on from Pergi and came to Antioch in Poseida, on the Sabbath day they went into a synagogue and sat down. After reading from, here's our key words, the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if any one of you have a word of encouragement for the people, then say it. So all of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas are sitting there. The law and the prophets are being read. Now there's an open mic. If anyone has something to say, say it. Boom, they go for it. 
And all of a sudden, we see men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. All begin, Paul begins to preach. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made it eat people during their stay in Egypt to land great and uplifted his arm and led them out. And for 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations, bless you, in the land of Canaan, he gave them as an inheritance. And he took about 450 years. So if you read on, he's basically giving the play-by-play -play on from the Exodus all the way to Israel. And we'll pick up here in verse 42. After he's done preaching and teaching from the law and the prophets, in verse 42 it reads, As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told on the next Sabbath. In other words, will you come and share next Saturday? Will you come next weekend and share? We're really interested on what you're saying about the Lord and of his Christ. And in verse 44, it says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, chapter 13, and starting in 13, we worked all the way down. That's fine. So I, I've showed you the Lord ministering from the law and the prophets. I've showed you Paul ministering from the law and prophets in Barnabas. And we also know that uh, Peter and the other apostles, they reasoned from the scriptures, okay? We see that the people really responded. Those that knew the word, show me in the word where you're talking about the word. Show me where that is. And for those who don't know the word, guess what? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. Amen. The word of God. So you see that without the word, can there be faith without the word? And God was the word. Beloved, it's critical that we know these scriptures that testify in the law and the prophets about the Christ. So what we're going to do today is we're going to, we're going to finish this teaching and this segment on this. There's, there are more prophecies than we're studying, just so you know. What we're doing is we are tackling some of the major prophecies about the familiar aspects of the gospel story and the narrative of the New Testament. And what we want to do is we want to talk about the prophecy and the fulfillment, the proclamation and the pursuit of truth, which is our position in Christ. In other words, this is the cause and effect, action, reaction, but it is the cause and the fulfillment, okay? Beloved, we live in such a rich day that we have not only seen the seed plant, we've seen it take root and provide a vineyard for many believers to come and take refuge. So let's go to Isaiah 61. We're going to talk about the ministry of Christ. We're going to talk about the betrayal of Christ. We're going to talk about the glory of Christ, the greater glory of Christ. So let's go to Isaiah 61. Colette, you're going to read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Tell me your name, brother. Jose. Tell me your name. Jose. Yeah. Jose. Santana. Santana, awesome. Santana, can you read a scripture in Luke? Okay, okay, Debbie, can you read uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 21? Now, we've reviewed this account when John the Baptist is in prison, and he says, hey, I'm about ready to, to donate my head, right? In other words, they're going to de-head me. Are you, I'm going to donate this to the gospel. I just want to make sure that this is indeed the, the real deal. And Jesus, hey, tell them, tell them what we're doing. The people who are blind see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk, right? Every box is being checked, rest assured, okay? So why don't we read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. We're looking at what Isaiah had to say. Keep in mind, we're, you know, six, seven, eight hundred, thousands of years before the Lord. All of these prophecies come. Go ahead in Isaiah 61. Amen. So we see that this is kind of also your mission and ministry. What I did, you will do greater things because I go to the Father. So everyone here is supposed to bind up the brokenhearted. Everyone here is supposed to lay hands on the sick. Everyone here is supposed to believe in excess for that which was wounded to be healed, broken to be 
uh, mend it up, okay? From that which is crooked to be made straight. In Jesus' mighty name. And let's go ahead and go to Luke 4, chapter, seven, uh, chapter 4, verses 17 to 21. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay. So as Jesus is reading... From the scriptures, okay, that's her reminder to read Luke 4. Uh, as Jesus is reading from the scripture, testifying of himself. So here's what he does. He tells you what he's going to do. Bless you. And then he does it. And then he tells you what he did. Beloved, that's the highest integrity. We started the service and Brent back, or everyone say hi to Brent. He has a little candy bar in the back. It's like an organic protein... It, all it does is it says what's in there. And it says it on the front because most things say it in the back and then they, they use special terms to not tell you there's chemicals in there. And everyone's like, I just want something that's made out of real food, right? So all of a sudden now they make these new candy bars or health bars, whatever, uh, like a, a protein bar or a snack bar, meal replacement bar. And it just says what's in there, okay? It do, and there's no gimmicks, no games. It just says what's in there. Okay, and that's a draw, a marketing plea because, hey, we're telling you like it is. And everyone's like, yes, we're hungry for truth. Okay, people are hungry for truth because we're tired of being deceived. How thankful should we be that Jesus simply tells us as it is in like it is? And he doesn't do it in an arrogant manner. He does it humble, with love. He speaks the truth in what? Grace and love. That's right. So he tells us what he's going to do, and he begins to do it. And God gives us such a head start. This is what you're going to see. And when you see it, you'll know it's time. Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah 31. Let's go to Jeremiah 31, 15. Randy, Jeremiah, in chapter 31 and verse 15. That's it. Okay, now we have a, a dynamic here that is a very sad, it's an epidemic of, of the loss of life, okay? It's called genocide. And here's what I want you to know, two things. One, the Lord tells you what he's going to do, then he does it, then he tells you what he did, and he asks you to participate, okay? Hey, participate in the cross. I already did the work, I already won the game. You still want to place your bet? Amen. How awesome is God, okay? But, but let's look at how does the enemy operate. The enemy comes not to give life and life more abundant to tell you what's going on. He comes to lie to you and to steal, kill, and destroy. So here's all of a sudden there's a prophecy. There's a, a weeping. There's, a, nash, there's a, a, a mourning and a weeping when Rachel refused, refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. And it's, it's an Old Testament play, but it's a New Testament prophecy on what? What is this a New Testament prophecy? How does this be fulfilled? And when it's filled... How does it testify to Christ? For the answer, let's go to Matthew 2. And we're looking at verse 16 to 18. Now, we know this is one of, the, one of the genocides. It's not the first. It's a genocide. Then Herod, we're in Matthew 2, starting in chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and sent and killed all the male children of Bethlehem in the region who were two years old and under. According to that time, he ascertained from the wise men or the magi. Then it was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. 
And Randy read from Jeremiah 31, 15, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping with loud lamentations. Rachel, weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now we know that Herod was troubled. Like, what's this king that's going to come and Messiah and ransom Israel? I'm the authority here. So what does he do? He offers the genocide. Every child two years or younger was to be slain. Now we know that this strategy is not unfamiliar to the enemy. Matter of fact, he's done this before. Let's all turn to Exodus 122. Now I'm going to set a comparison here between Jesus and Moses because the Bible does. Because Moses is the, uh, if you will say, he's the federal head of the first covenant. And Jesus is the federal head of the second covenant, which is the better covenant, our new covenant. Rather than first and second, I would say old and new because there's no third, okay? Let's all go to Exodus chapter 1 and 22. Colette, can you read Exodus 1 and verse 22? Okay, now, let's give you the, the background here. The, the new Pharaoh came, which didn't know about Joseph and his brothers and the tribes of Israel. All He inherited basically a slave people, the Hebrews, and he had his nation of Egypt. And all of a sudden, he, he, he acknowledged that, wow, these Hebrews are multiplying greatly, and I'm afraid they're going to overthrow me and take away my empire and have their own. So you know what? Let's kill all the males. If we kill all the leaders, there can be no leadership, which is why all the babies were thrown into the Nile, right? Which is why Moses, right, he was put in a little reeded basket, and he was gathered by the princess, right, and her, uh, her slave servant. And all of a sudden, by the midwives, he was nursed, and all of a sudden he became kind of adopted, if you will, into the Egyptian culture until the Lord revealed his mighty ways. I think that's happened to a lot of us here. We kind of were adopted into the ways of the world before God revealed our purpose and our plan. All of a sudden, we went back to our people, the kingdom and citizens of God, and began to testify to the ways and will of God our Father. And what happens here is we see that the enemy always tries to stop the ways of God. He tries to stop the leadership of God. Tries to stop the, every time we're trying to go to the church, something happens. We get in a fight. The car breaks down. You know, this is, I get an emergency call. I have to go into work. Isn't that, isn't that convenient? Every time I'm going to the place where God's about to speak, boom, the enemy strikes. I think we should wisen up by now that no matter what hurdle comes before us, jump over it. Okay? Have an Olympic spirit. Overcome. Jump over the hurdle. Do not allow the devil to steal, kill, and destroy from your destiny. No matter what, you must move forward. But we're seeing here a comparison. Moses was so powerful because of God's grace that the devil tried to kill him. Jesus is the son of God. He is all powerful. And he was also tried. The devil tried to kill him. His life was tried. But we know that you can't stop God. Everyone say, you can't stop God. For if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen. Now let's go to Hebrews 3. I'm going to read this. Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brothers, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. You who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all of God's house. Thank you, Lord. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, why am I giving this background? Because a lot of the Jewish people say, well, we're disciples of Moses. Who's this Jesus you're preaching? We follow Moses. Beloved, there's someone greater than Moses. For Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house as honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were going to be spoken later. Beloved, do not mistake who Moses was. He was a sign pointing to Messiah, which is why when we read the scriptures, you understand that Moses and the prophets were all signs on the highway pointing to a destination. They were not the destination. 
Do you understand that the Pharisees and the scribes were pointing to Moses as though he was the destination as Moses was pointing to Messiah as Messiah was the destination? Even out of his own mouth, he said, the Lord will raise up someone like unto me. Now, Christ, in verse 6, is faithful over God's house as a son, whereas Moses was a servant. Tell me who's greater. Now, we are his house if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and boast in our hope. If we stay confident, if we are unmoving and unshaken in our confidence and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're his house. And we're secure in him. Let's go to Jeremiah 31 again. I want to show you about the new covenant that Jesus makes, the superior covenant to that of the Old Testament, to that of the Old Covenant, to that of Moses. In Jeremiah 31, and let's go to verse 31 and 32. And it reads, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the old covenant. The covenant of the law. The covenant of Moses. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. There's going to be a new covenant. And let's see here in Luke chapter 22.20. Let's find that fulfillment of a new covenant fulfilled in Luke 22, 20. And as Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, fulfilling the Passover, he lifts the cup, saying this in verse 20, chapter 22. Likewise, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out is the new covenant in my blood. Beloved, right here, he's making history forever. Pay attention, people of God. New covenant starts right here in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. The moment Jesus takes the cup and says, this is the new covenant in my blood. The moment he sheds his blood on the cross, it's finished. That means Passover is pointing. It starts in the Old Testament. It's a fulfillment of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a better, it is the superior covenant. Now let's also talk, why did the covenant have to be made with his blood? Why couldn't he just give a promise? Why did it have to be by the, the actual, because a lot of people talk, but they don't act. They're all words, in other words. Or they make promises, but they don't keep them. You know what Jesus did? He said, I'll tell you what, not only I can fulfill the promise, I can fulfill the law, but you can't. So how am I going to fulfill it to you unless I give my life as a gift to you? Beloved, do not underestimate the power of the gospel, the power of the life of Jesus Christ, the power of the blood. For those of you who believe, nothing's impossible to you. Amen. This is actually legal atonement in the, in the heavens. We are adjudicated forever because of this shedding of the blood, propitiation for sin, the payment of his life for the ransom of yours. Let's find it here. Let's go to Exodus 24. Now, the Old Covenant was made by blood as well. Most people don't know this. The Old Covenant was also made by blood. Let's pick up here in Exodus 24 and verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in a covenant in accordance with all these words. Even the Old Testament and the Old Covenant was made with blood. Thrown on the people. Which means this blood has to be paid for you, for your life. And let's go to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 11. It's almost the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 9.11. Thank you, Lord. In Zechariah 9 and 11, it reads this, As also for you, because of, because of the blood of my covenant with you. 
because of the blood of my covenant. What's he talking about? Exodus 24, 8. Here's the blood of the covenant for you. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Thank you for saying it's a superior covenant because we find that this is not merely, and let's actually, I could explain this to you. Let's do it through the word of God. Let's get more perfect language on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 reads this. Who, God, who has made a, us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But the Spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You have been given the Spirit. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll start in 11 to verse 14. But Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, in other words, not made with hands, that is, nor of this creation, meaning this is not the tabernacle, this is a real body now, he entered once and for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves. Beloved, hear the contrast. The blood of the old covenant was the blood of animals. Okay? That's a sacrifice, but let's be honest. How many, you know, there's a thousand sheep, a thousand bulls. Here's a bull for a sacrifice. Versus the life of the Son of God. And we love animals. I know a lot of people have animals as pets. And I used to have a pet dog, and he was like, you know, you treat dogs like children nowadays. It's like, okay, helper of mankind, they're always filled with love. That's awesome. God gave them to us as a gift. We have dominion over them. But they are not human life. Let's, let's, let's find here, why is this covenant superior? By the means of his own blood. How many of you have, how many of you have given away you know, a dog, or you had to go somewhere and you give someone your dog, or someone gives you a dog, or you go to the pound and you inherit a dog, okay? So that there's an exchange of animals. How many of you would give your own blood? And I'm not talking about a pint. Oh, I want to help out, take a pint. I, I'll be tired for a half hour, but that's my sacrifice, right? I mean, how many of you would open the veins and say, you can have it all? I prefer your life over mine. I just haven't met anyone in my whole life that would ever do that yet except for Jesus Christ. We're in Hebrews chapter 9, 11 to 14. It says, For the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of, sprinkles a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer, sanctify for purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We're comparing the old sacrificial system to the new covenant where Jesus sacrifices his own life once and for all, for you and for you. Amen. Let's go to Psalm 41. It's amazing that Jesus takes... The Old Testament example and makes it a New Testament reality. Signing it and stamping it with his own life. Let's go to Psalm 41.9. We're gaining traction on these prophecies. How should, we, how should we minister? Why should you believe that Jesus is the Christ beloved? Through the law and the prophets. Systematically we are going through the prophecies and the fulfillment of these prophecies. We are reasoning through the word of God, which is flawless. We are comparing the old to the new, the, the pointing to and the fulfilling of. And in Psalm 41, verse 9, listen to this. We have some details also, not only about the shedding of the blood, but of the details of the betrayer. Even my close friend whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Even my close friend who ate my bread lifted his heel against me. Now let's go to John 13, 19. Because there's a lot of, I mean, there's even paintings and carvings around this Passover supper. All the disciples are on his right and their left. As a matter of fact, after this conversation, they begin to ask, who's going to sit at your right and left hand in the eternal banquet? Who's going to be the greatest? 
And we see here in John chapter 13, verse 9, look at this fulfillment of the Psalms. By the way, the Psalms were written a thousand years BC, and now we're 33 AD. John 13, 19 reads this. We're all flipping there to make eye contact. I am telling you now before this takes place that when it does, you may believe that I am he. Truly I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, we know that Jesus is sending us forth, right? We know that he's sending us forth in his power and in his spirit and in his authority. But we know that who he's talking about, the, the betrayal that Jesus is talking about, he's talking about who? Does anyone know who he's talking about? Yes. He's talking about Judas. Jesus is talking about Judas because we know historically that the one who dips this cup Right? The one who dips this cup is the one who denies me. And we also know that Jesus isn't moved by this. He's saying that if, if I send you out, you're going in my name, and whoever accepts you accepts me. And while he's having these conversations, beloved, while he's having these conversations, we see that Judas is the one who betrays him. Okay? So right now, come with me to Luke real quick. I want to give you the context for this. Let's go to Luke 22. Somebody read 14. Actually, let's start in verse 20 and read 21 and 22. Luke 22, 20 to 22. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, woe to that man, woe to that man who betrays me, and we know that my close friend ate my bread, lifted his heel against me. Let's go back to John. Now, I read John 13 and 19, which again reads this. 13, 19 reads, I am telling you this now before it takes place, so that when it does, you may believe that I am he. Now, remember I told you, Jesus tells you what's going to happen, and he tells you what happens. But let's read John 13, 18. I am not speaking to all of you whom I know I've chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread is lifting up his heel against me. Now you know he's saying this as Judas is dipping his Passover bread in the cup. I'm saying this to you so that you will know that I am he. Think about how powerful this is. While I'm commissioning you guys, there is yet one of you who will betray me. And it's the very one who's eaten my bread. And I'm saying this so that you know the scripture is fulfilled. What is that scripture? And it's in Psalm 41, 9. 1,033 years ago. He who's ate my bread is lifting up his heel against me. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. Mark 14, and let's look at verse 18.
They were all reclining at the table eating, and Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one who will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and say, Who is it, Lord? And he said to him, It is the one of the twelve who is dipping his bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. In other words, beloved, this must happen to fulfill the scriptures, but woe to the man who betrays me. But woe to the one through whom which it is fulfilled. The question you ask, so Judas did betray Jesus. And we know that this was actually to fulfill the scriptures. It's not that the gospel got hijacked and that, oh no, the Lord was betrayed. What do we do now? Beloved, everything that has happened to you, the Lord is fully aware of. Everything that has happened to you and that will happen to you. Why don't we look at Zechariah 11? I know what we're all asking. So he was betrayed. What was the price? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 11. And we're looking at 12 and 13. Jessica, that's you. I mean to the detail, to the exact amount. Zechariah 11, let's look at 12 and 13. The price, listen to this, this language here. The price at which I was priced by them. In other words, the price that they valued my life was how much? 30. 30 pieces of silver. Turn with me to Matthew 27. Colette, Matthew 27 in verse 3. Judas was paid how many coins for Jesus' life? 30 pieces. 30 pieces of what? Silver. The exact amount the Lord prophesied that you would value my life at 30 pieces of silver, you would sell out your friend. 30 pieces of silver, you would sell out Messiah. For 30 pieces of silver, you would trade the life of God. Let's go to Malachi. This is the last book in the Old Testament. Not only has Jesus come and told us what was going to happen, he would be pierced, he would be betrayed, he would be sold, he would move in power, he would be pierced, he would be uh, brutally beaten, and he would raise again. Beloved, there's no area of his ministry that he left ambiguous. There's nothing that he didn't tell us he was going to do. As a matter of fact, he told us he's going to do it, he did it, then he came back and said, well, I, I told you to encourage us. Take hope. I've told you what I did, and I did it. Now I will tell you greater things. God. Let's go to Malachi 3.1, because, beloved, there's more to this. Malachi 3.1, 400 years before Matthew takes step in this scene, in the story of God. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will pre prepare a way before me. When the Lord you seek will come suddenly to his temple. I will send a messenger before me to prepare the way. Now let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 in verse 2 through 4 reads this. As it is written... By Isaiah the prophet, behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one 
crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 43. The Bible is so rich. Bring me this, Chetty Wendy. Now in Mark, he's saying this is fulfilled by Isaiah. You're saying, what do you mean, Isaiah? You just, you just read Malachi to us. Beloved, like I said, there, is, there are more scriptures. There are more scriptures than we're going to cover. These are the major ones. Let's go to Isaiah 43. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up. Every mountain will be made low. The uneven ground will be level. In the rough places, plain. Amen? Isaiah, 43. Isaiah 40 in verse 3. Now, it's amazing when you hear the detail because in Isaiah, remember the time frame. Isaiah is about 600 B.C., five-something. Make straight the way of the Lord. Every valley lifted up, every mountain made low, uneven ground level, rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Now, how many of you, how many of you actually know the message that John the Baptist preached? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What else did he say? Okay. And what did he say? If you have two tunics, give one away. Don't ask more of the wages than are right. You know that he basically leveled. He was the, the measuring stick. He brought sobriety to the people of God as they were repenting to know the new way, to know the new order. Matter of fact, his gospel, the gospel of John, as he is preaching to the people, prepare the way of the Lord, he begins to uh, remove favoritism from the people. He begins to remove, uh, how shall I say this, unsobriety, the lack of proper judgment. He removes greed. In all of his words, he is moving systematically to bring such a sober and balanced message to the people of God. Turn with me to John. And let's look at verse 23. G, uh, John's being questioned, by the way. Hey, this guy's moving in authority that we have not seen before. So who is this guy? And let's pick up in John chapter 1 and verse 23. Randy, why don't you read that? John chapter 1, verse 23. Amen. Amen. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now let's go to Matthew 3. So obviously John knows who he is too. There's prophecy about the messenger. The messenger's quoting the prophecy. Jesus is quoting the prophecy. What's interesting here is where we are about to go from Old and New Testament prophecy and fulfillment to our modern calling, each and every person in this room. After John 1.23, after John 1.23 we're going to go to Matthew chapter 3. In verse 2, repent, this is John's message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and to make his paths straight. Beloved, the question that I have for you today is will you make the path of the Lord straight? You understand that Jesus does all the work. Jesus is the one who does the healing. It's by his name. He's the one who does everything. He paid, he paid the tab. All you do is tell the person, yep, tab's on him. 
He did all the labor. He did all the work. He sweat. He was bruised. He was beat. And yet, he sinned not. And all you have to do is remind people of that. Amen. Why don't we close our Bibles?